Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to If Data Could Talk. It's great to be back. I'm Andy Cogreve, Technical Evangelist at Tableau, and today we are talking about doing no harm, specifically the doing no harm guide. How do we, as data communicators, work with intent and empathy in everything we do? So we have a full house today, and I want to dive right into it. So let's get on with some introductions and then talk about the doing no harm guide. John, welcome to the show. Do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, Andy. Uh, good to see you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm John Schwabish. I am a senior fellow at the Urban Institute, uh, which is a nonprofit research uh, institution based in Washington, D.C. And uh, the uh, authors of this particular guide are myself and Alice uh, Fang, who uh, I guess we'll hand it to next. Yeah, Alice, say hi. Hello everyone, my name is Alice Fang. It's great to be here. Uh, I'm currently working as a senior data scientist at Natera, a biotech company out in the Bay Area, but was previously a data visualization developer at the Urban Institute where I work with John on this Do No Harm Guide. Great to have you with us, Alice and John. And we have a Tableau colleague with us today as well, uh, Channing. Hi, tell us who you are. Uh, hi Andy, uh, thanks for having me this morning. Um, Hello everyone, my name is Channing Nesbitt. I am a social impact program manager with the Tableau Foundation. And super fortunate to be able to work with John and Alice on this guide, and I'm happy to be here today. All right. Well, look, th thanks everybody for joining us, and let's dive right into what this Doing No Harm guide is. Uh, so, Alice, I want to come to you straight away. Uh, you, you at the Urban Institute produced the Doing No Harm guide. Can you give us a little bit of background about what kind of harm we're trying to prevent and why the guide uh, came about? Yeah, sure. So, the Do No Harm guide is all about uh, as you mentioned, Andy, earlier, people, we want people to be intentional and thoughtful when making data visualizations. It's, it's important not to just make technically good charts, but we want to make ones that are inclusive, that embrace diversity, that embrace empathy. Because um, unfortunately, there are examples uh, in the past of data visualizations that don't embrace those principles and have had harmful impacts. Uh, so the origins of this guide actually started from... Um, some work in, that John and I were doing, uh, we were going to update uh, Urban's existing data visualization style guide. It had been a couple of years since it had originally come out and we wanted to just add some more content, update some of the advice. And we knew we wanted to add whole new sections to the style guide, talking about other topics such as accessibility, such as the uh, perceptual underpinnings of data viz. And one of those sections we wanted to add was thinking about how to approach data visualization with an inclusive and equitable lens. Uh, but as we found out, as we were trying to write this part of the guide, there weren't a whole lot of resources out there on this topic. There weren't a whole lot of people really exploring this space. So we, with uh, kind of a lack of reference materials, our work on this uh, front was kind of, was pretty slow for a while. Uh, then the COVID-19 pandemic hit and things really ground to a halt. I mean, just on the entire update effort, uh, we really just, Unfortunately, attention was diverted to other projects, um, but it wasn't until last summer, summer 2020, when well, many racial justice protests uh, sprung up across the U.S. in response to the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and many others, uh, that John and I felt like we couldn't just sit on our hands on this any longer. We really needed to try to do something, and if other people weren't going to be tackling this issue, then we would try to put ourselves out there and uh, plant some ideas. So we took the few uh, materials that we were able to find on this topic, combined it with our own thoughts and experiences uh, from working in the field of data viz, and wrote a very brief, about four page paper with some of our initial thoughts on this topic. Uh, the paper was really well received. We presented at a couple of conferences uh, and a couple uh, got a lot of good feedback on it. And uh, at the same time, I think Urban was starting to build a relationship with Tableau. And so Tableau got wind of the work John and I were doing on this space and um, was excited to support us. Uh, I think in the original proposal, John was too modest and thought that we would just speak to you know, a handful of people, uh, blow the four pages out into maybe 10 or so. Uh, but as we actually started approaching people to speak with um, about this issue, we got just such an overwhelming response that we ended up conducting you know, over a dozen interviews, spoke to nearly 20 people. Uh, the predicted 10 pages became over 50 pages of material and, and uh, associated resources, toolkits. Um, and eventually it became this do no harm guide that uh, we see in front of us today. And uh, 
when you first thought you might add this to your existing visualization style guide, how long did you think it would be in that first moment? Two paragraphs? Maybe Probably. a page at most. Yeah, isn't yeah, that amazing? A couple and, and to listeners, it might sound like a daunting number, 50 pages, and it, it, it it's a lot of words, but I believe me, there's no wasted words in this, and it really is uh, incredible information. There's 10 guidelines, which we're going to dive into a few of them in a moment. Um, so we'll, and we'll share links to everything underneath wherever you are watching this. Um, so thanks, Alice. And uh, Channing, well, Alice, you just mentioned the Foundation's involvement. Uh, how did Channing tell us something about maybe introduce the Tableau Foundation and uh, yeah. how did how did that involvement start and how could you hope, hope it grows? Yeah, for sure. Um, the Tableau Foundation is the philanthropic arm of Tableau software as a whole. So we work with a team of about five of us. We're all social impact program managers who kind of focus on different portfolios of impact across different sectors in our country and internationally as well. Um, I have the fortunate opportunity um, to work on a lot of our racial equity work. So when um, we were getting in contact with Urban, we had just launched the Racial Justice Data Initiative um, after the results of the murders of George Floyd and all the uprisings of uh, last year at this point. Um, and that initiative had a real kind of focus on combating systemic racism across the US um, and really focusing on um, anti-Black racism as well. And at that time, like Alice mentioned, we were starting to get in conversations with Urban, um, with Jonathan quite a bit, uh, really frequently. And the, this idea of this guide came up. And for us, it really resonated because throughout the initiative, there was this idea of wanting to democratize and de-weaponize the use of data in order for people to advance their use and understanding of data uh, to combat these issues that we're facing. And so when we're talking about the impact of this guide, we really, we're excited about the focus on empathy and the humanization that this guide actually presents of people who are using this data and performing this type of analysis. And that's something we wanted to instill across the entire uh, racial justice data initiative as a whole. And so like Alice mentioned, uh, when we were first talking with Jonathan, this idea that the guide would be 10 pages was something we immediately latched onto. And then I remember actually when Jonathan brought back one of the initial drafts and it turned into this 50 page document, it was something we were initially like really, really excited about, not something we anticipated, but we were like, yeah, this is super important. A lot of this information had been talked about, but hadn't been put together and synchronized in a way that was so clear and, and forward as this guide is. And so simultaneously, we had launched the racial equity data hub at this moment in time, which is really a piece of the racial justice data initiative, but also a standalone platform. And we thought this would be a great place to uh, kind of co-feature um, this guide essentially and really just bring a lot more eyes and ears to it essentially because it really is getting at that point of how more people can use this data and, and and use that democratization aspect to get their hands on it and so we were just welcoming this idea of this this guide as, as it as it stands now uh, and wanted to make sure that everybody had their opportunity to get their hands on it and read through it and start thinking about the ideas that are presented in the guide as yeah. well we'll get into in a second yeah, thanks. Thanks, Channing. So, so John, tell us, um, you know, give us a bit more flavor on that genesis. Is, is this, have you seen this as an endemic problem in data visualization or an opportunity to stem, uh, stem things before they start? You, you know, to what extent is this an issue that already exists? Yeah, I mean, I think, before, I, so I think it's a little bit of both, but I also just want to like point out that I promised or I thought about this 10 or 15 page guide, but anybody who knows me should have known right away that I was underselling how long this thing was going to be. Like Alice and I have worked together for a long time. Like we should have known that this was just going to, just going to be a lot, a lot longer, especially, you know, when we started, we had like a small list, I think of people that we wanted to interview. And as soon as you start talking to people, and of course, as Alice mentioned, like there wasn't a lot of work about this. So once we started talking to people, people get very excited that there's this, you know, that there's work being done. And so they say, you should talk to this person and this person, and this person, which is terrific. And our interviews were all fantastic, but of course, then it just, it just blossoms into this, into this big project. But I just feel like everybody at Urban who I work with just sort of like, when they hear this story, they'll just sigh and sort of nod and be like, yeah, that, that's, that sounds about right. Um, but anyway, to, to your question, whether it's this sort of preventative or if it's, or if it's fixing a problem, I, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's both. Um, I think in the in the guide we we show several examples of visualizations that are uh, some visualizations that are explicitly racist that have had long and enduring impacts on 
uh, people and communities. Um, and then there's also visualizations that are um, racist in the sense of not embracing uh, a form of equity and inclusion. And I always uh, think, and I, I think our perspective on this shows through the papers that I think we come to these as not the creators are not trying or are not coming to these uh, issues with malice or um, or with hatred or with racism in their heart. But but there's just issues that maybe we don't know about. So one of the examples we show uh, in the in the guide that we'll talk about in a little bit is, you know, how the color palette of a particular uh, Tableau dashboard sort of has these various implications about how we might uh, group or relate uh, different different racial groups. And I think for those of us who are working with data and visualizing data and communicating data all the time, um, I think we have an opportunity as a field and as individuals and as organizations to grow and to prevent harm. I think that we have an opportunity to think more consciously and more purposely about how we would and do talk about people and talk about communities and talk with the communities um, that we are that we are focusing on. I think for me, uh, as primarily a, someone who's come from a quantitative background, I think that for me, that's like the biggest lesson learned from, from the work that we did is that it's so important to talk to people, to understand their lived experiences, to understand um, how they want to be represented in the work that we're doing, which is not an easy thing to do, both in terms of like practically you know, talking to people and calling people and having these mm -hmm. conversations. But also when you're thinking about, you know, we're looking at, I don't know, the accumulation of, of wealth among uh, different different households in the United States. You know, who do we talk to about how people want to be referenced in that? I mean, that's that's not an easy question to ask. And so one of the things that we mentioned up front in this, in the guide and, and come back to over and over again is that we don't really lay out rules in, in the document, that we're laying out strategies and we're laying out approaches um, and guidelines. And I think part of the work here is trying to set a marker down so that we can have these conversations. And that's why we were so excited to, to have the Tableau Foundation support because they're sort of tapped into this larger uh, area of people working with data. And, and actually as part of the, 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 uh, the racial equity hub at the Tableau Foundation, people can go in and make comments about the guide and, and we get those comments. And so we're going to try to incorporate those into, into future work. So we're really excited to have these these two organizations partnering together because we get this broader uh, audience of people that we can that yeah. we can talk with and learn from. Yeah, that's great. I, I, it's in, it's it's amazing you say that because I think you know my own, my own personal journey since, since the uh, events of last year. You know, I, I had to go on a journey learning more about anti-racism, perhaps my own biases, and you know the privilege I've had in in doing working in this field. Now, ten years of working in this field. The other great thing I learned is that. It's not hard to learn to be a great data communicator. The principles, it's not, it's, it's not rocket science. It's a damn cliche that, but you know, the principles are all really basic. It's just we never really learn them. And then from the do no harm guide, you know, for someone like me, you know, I've been thinking, well, what can I do in light of the events of the last 12 months? Um, it's like, well, I can be more empathetic. And these these guidelines are just great things to have in my head. They're not complicated, but they just raise awareness. So I, I think, you know, on a personal level, uh, goal achieved i think it's really good and it comes down to you know there are 10 recommendations some about uh, constructing visualizations some about the way we uh, create community and outreach and we're going to dive into some of those now so here's a, we're going to do a quick overview of some of these details i think alice you're going to talk about one of the first, one of the principles which is about empathy and uh, putting yourself perhaps in in people's positions do you want to say something about that and we can bring up um uh, a particular chart that's in the guide. So tell us, tell us about the principle of empathy. Yeah, I mean, I would say empathy is really what undergirds the, the guide itself, right? It's the idea of putting yourself in someone else's shoes and, and trying to think about how you know, they would feel seeing themselves represented in a data visualization. Uh, so this chart here is an example that we felt kind of missed the mark when it came to empathy. I mean, just look at the way these icons are represented. Like, how would you feel if you were an Indian woman and you were that teeny tiny little icon at the far right? Or on the other end, if you were a Latvian woman and you saw yourself as some massive lumbering giant, right? Just, <laughs> I, I, this is definitely a chart that I wouldn't be surprised if people were offended by it, right? 
Mm -hmm. I mean, part of the reason why it has this kind of really distortive effect is because there there are problems with the chart in and of itself. Um, The fact that the y-axis doesn't start at zero and that the icons are scaled by uh, area rather than just by height, right? All that distortion gives us this effect that we see here. Uh, But in terms of the uh, principles of equity, inclusiveness, empathy that we talk about in the guide, uh, this chart is also problematic because it reinforces uh, stereotypes, right? The the choice of the colors, right? A a chart about women is using various shades of pink. Uh, All the icons here are wearing dresses. Um, So, you know, all these things are uh, reinforced stereotypes of uh, what we think of as women femininity. Um, and, you know, as John mentioned earlier, I doubt that the creator of this chart was doing this intentionally, that they were trying to be sexist. But I think this is just an example of what happens if you kind of act on autopilot, you just go on defaults, so you don't think very carefully about uh, these design decisions. You end up mm-hmm. with charts like these that just uh, don't embrace empathy and can really have a harmful offensive impact. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, as I say, everything you've said, it's, it's, I, common sense isn't right. It's just it's just having that uh, thought process to get in there. So, John, we'll, we'll come on to uh, ordering data next. It, and it, do you have anything else to say about the empathy piece, or should we dive straight into uh, the way in which we order categories? You know, no, I, I think I think Alice summed it up summed it up perfectly. I think you know, it, and I think I'll just I'll just add that I think again from from my you know just like you, Andy, I've gone on my own journey over the last eighteen months or so. But I think from from specifically from the data. And the data side of things, you know, I, I was trained as a, an economist, which was like all quantitative uh, mm. education. There was no qualitative education. So to put yourself in the shoes of, of other people um, is hard to do when you just sit behind your computer and you just download some data and just sort of click around. It, it does require some conversations. It does require, you know, reaching out to people and, and trying to understand other people's experiences. So um, so, so I think it's, is, as, as, uh, Alice said, it does undergird the whole report. So the through line that we try to draw through, through everything, yeah. but specifically in ordering data, the, the, the picture you, that we have up in, in front of us is the question on race from the U S decennial census. So from the, from the recent census where the results are just, just now, um, sort of coming out. Um, and if you look through this, uh, through this form, it's probably very familiar, especially to people in the United States, because basically every major federal survey is structured very similarly. So the first question is, you know, so what is your race? You know, uh, the first option is white, there's a little box, you can check the box, and then you have an option here now, which we didn't used to have in the past, but you could write in more details here. So, you know, they say German, Irish, English, etc. Then the second option is black or African American, and the third option is American Indian or Alaska Native, and, and so on and so forth. And what happens when the Census Bureau collects this information is they bring it into their database so they, they can create the data files for us to use as they code the first category is one, second category is two, third category is three, and so on and so forth. And so when people download the data, they make their bar charts or they make their tables or they run the regressions or they run their statistics, and they always show, I mean, at least from the economics literature, they always show the results as white, black, American Indian, Chinese, Filipino, just follows that that ordering. Um, And we have to ask ourselves, first off, why are the, the questions ordered in this particular way, right? Does it come from a position of institutional structural structural racism where white becomes the default white is the norm um why are they set up that way but but for those of us who are just working with these data when we download them and we use them we can take a more purposeful and thoughtful approach to how we are going to order the bars in the bar chart or the slices of the pie in the pie chart or the the orders in the in the tables in the in the uh, the the numbers in the table um you know we we've come up with some other ideas again like <laughs> i think these are like like you said, Andy, like this isn't really rocket science. Like what are some alternatives? Well, alphabetical is an option. Uh, Sample size is an option, either weighted or unweighted. Mm -hmm. Uh, The story is an option. If you're focused on, uh, you know, uh, poverty rates among, you know, people identify as native Hawaiians, maybe that group comes first. I mean, um, and, you know, population might be the right ordering. Like in certain cases, I'm sure population is the right ordering. And in the United States, white people, account for the vast majority of of people in the United States. So that ordering is fine. But what we are encouraging people to do is to think 
uh, purposely and, and strategically about how they're going to uh, order these uh, these different groups in, in their work. Um, and again, there's not like a rule, but it's just being more thoughtful about this and to think about yeah. maybe white or maybe men or maybe you know any of these groups or any of the intersections of these groups shouldn't just be ordered in some default that we're not thinking about just sort of spitting it back out. We need to think more more uh, carefully about it. Yeah, that's great. And, and I think following straight on, the next one we wanted to cover was... Um aggregation levels uh, which is again you know with, with the census giving allowing for more granular data can we take advantage of that and if we do or don't take advantage of that what uh, potential uh, what are the potential risks there and i think alice uh, th what's on screen now is an example from the do no harm guide uh, do you want to talk about aggregation um to, to this chart or, or a different one perhaps yeah sure sure yes so uh what we have here is a chart that john and i made to illustrate exactly that point andy right what are the harms or potential downsides of aggregating data. Uh, so what we have here is a script chart showing poverty rates uh, by race and ethnicity. And in the US, uh, most of the time we see this statistic reported out uh, for these larger racial buckets, right? The, what is the six groups that you see on your left. Um, but this, when we do this, this can really mask some um, important differences that exist within each of the smaller communities that make up these larger buckets, right? So uh, the point we wanted to illustrate here was in particular the Asian or Pacific Islander group, right? A uh, very, very diverse group consisting of various different uh, countries, uh, spans a huge chunk of the world, a huge population. Um, but when we just report out poverty rates for this group at that higher aggregated level, we're missing a lot of the variation that we see here, right? I mean, this spans from people who identify as being Chinese and Japanese having poverty rates around maybe like this is about 5% uh, to those being Mongolian Americans uh, at nearly 30%. I mean, that is just a huge spread, but that gets masked over when we only report that 9.7% of Asians and Pacific Islanders are in poverty. And this has really important implications in terms of under, our understanding of this issue, right? our understanding of who is affected, who is in poverty, and therefore what kinds of programs we design, who needs help, what kind of policies we craft. Uh, so this, again, this is an example of why it's important for people to consider carefully how they're handling their data, whether or not aggregating uh, is the appropriate thing to do here, because uh, when we do that thought thoughtlessly, uh, it can again have harms, right? Because we are now, uh, masking over people uh, within these larger groups who uh, perhaps aren't doing as well um, and by making them look like they are in a much better situation than they actually are. Yeah, I, it's, it, I find this one incredible. That, you know, the concept of always being able to aggregate and disaggregate data is really important. Um, two years ago, I was very privileged to interview Roberto Orosai, who was the lead researcher on the project that discovered water on Mars. And the reason I wanted to interview him, because when I heard about how they discovered it, he had disaggregated his data, aggregated, and he kept zooming in and out of this data. And that process of aggregation and disaggregation enabled him to make the hypothesis that then was proven there's liquid water underneath the polar, cap, polar ice caps. It's like, wow, that's mind blowing. And then there's goofy examples where you say, well, what's the average uh, salary in an MBA or uh, English Premier League? team you're like well when you aggregate it it seems like the average salary is really high but that's because there's just a few highly paid sports stars that skew the results hugely but then when you see an example like this it really it just brings home the power that oh yeah but actually you know they're great examples of science and fun examples in sport but no this could actually influence policy and my opinions uh, of, of the topic at hand so um yeah it's a, it's it's a it's a great example um now so if, if people want to dive into this more, please do, because there's, there's, there's 10 principles, as we said, that are in this document. But uh, one of them is I want to come to you about Channing, because it's not so much about the construction of visualizations, but it's about the methods and the communities and the, the culture of uh, visualization and communications we might uh, uh, have. So do you want to talk about um, community and build, but reaching out and building a community? Yeah, I wanted to briefly touch on this one um, because it's so important and it is, it's one that in, it, it, it brings together each level of engagement. It, so you have the, from my standpoint, you have the foundation or the organization that is supporting this type of work being promoted. You have the analyst or the researcher that is doing the analysis, performing the analysis and, and coming to certain conclusions. You have the advocate who 
at the end of this all is going to be taking these ideas and trying to implement change in their communities. And so for all of those individual groups, they're stakeholders, but they are, and they're experts in the data potentially, but there's also experts in the experience that need to be included as well. Because these people at the end of the day are being, are becoming vulnerable in the analysis for better and for worse in certain cases. And without their input and without their kind of, um, their guidance and just hearing about what they're actually going through on a day-to-day -day basis and how they're living through these experiences, it's, le it's leaving out part of um, the information that needs to be displayed and needs to be shared across communities, across organizations and across different groups that are working on combating these issues. And so I really appreciated this aspect um, that was included in this guide because I think it's something that will inform how we at the Tableau Foundation do our work how we working on the Racial Equity Data Hub will do our work, how other organizations that are working in this space of social impact will do this work, but more importantly, how each and every individual from students to, like I said, advocates and analysts are performing this type of analysis going forward. And whether it's, whether if it's forming community stakeholder groups where you're bringing in different members of the community across different aspects of life and professional experiences, just bringing together those voices is what's gonna take the principles of this guide and really instill them across each level and each sector that uh, that needs to have this information at the end of the day. Yeah, that's great. And and what's um what's the what what, what how will the Tablet Foundation continue to use the guide? The guide um, we are super excited about this guide kind of growing in, in prominence. Essentially, we are um, currently at work trying to embed this in different forms of training um, assets that are going to be coming out as the year goes on. Um, we're currently actually in production of a trailhead module as well on the Salesforce side, so we're really excited about that uh going live this fall at some point and one other thing that i'm really excited to share is um the guide has been so informative for not only the foundation's work and social impact work but we're even bringing this into conversations about how the tableau platform itself will evolve so we're talking about inclusive analytic strategy essentially and how can we take the principles of this guide and embed this into the actual tableau data platform so folks who are using it can have an equity and inclusive lens to how they're, as they're creating the visualizations they're creating. Um, so I would say just embedding this across the entire ecosystem of Tableau is something that's super important. And we're going to continue to encourage and, and, and push the principles of this guide out far and wide to make sure that anybody who is using data, whether you're in the Tableau community or outside, but you're part of the larger data community, have these principles at the forefront of, uh, of their minds and are making sure that these are incorporated into all forms of work that is coming out. Oh, that's great. That's really exciting. I mean, definitely the integration into a platform, that's going to be incredible to see. Uh, John, what about you from the Urban Institute's perspective? You know, you know, what's the reception been like and what, what, what do you think will happen next? Yeah, it's been pretty amazing. I mean, I think urban in general, we have a, a lot of efforts underway around, around diversity, equity, inclusion. We're hiring a, a new chief uh, equity officer. We have a, a new uh, senior position that we're bringing people in. Um, we're doing a lot of stuff also internally, uh, especially on like research lines. So how do we think about uh, writing uh, with this equity lens? How do we think about interviewing people and creating data? So there's a lot of work going on uh, within urban across lots of different um, uh, lots of lots of different centers. We also have a new uh, racial equity action lab uh, that's working specifically on on issue public policy issues around around race and ethnicity. So there's a lot going on. I think you know looking forward. Um, you know, Alice and I have been talking already about, you know, what would another, what would volume two look like for, for a do no harm guide? Um, you know, like we mentioned earlier, I don't think we have all the answers, any of the answers. We don't have, we certainly don't have all the answers. I'm, maybe we don't have any, any of the answers. Um, you know, I think we are, um, we're encouraged by the feedback that we've been getting um, almost entirely positive. I mean, the amount of requests that Alice and I have now to do talks about this and to do trainings, which we're, which we're sort of figuring out, like, what does a training around this look mm -hmm. like? Um, it is, is in some ways difficult because I'll, I'll just say that one of the challenges is having these hard conversations and people aren't necessarily, well, I'll say white people, especially aren't, uh, accustomed to having conversations about race and having conversations about, um, their, uh, their privilege, their experience. And I think these conversations are hard to have. So it is an interesting challenge to figure out how would a training around the do no harm guide work? Um, not to mention in our COVID world of all being, you know, uh, little boxes on Zoom, it's not probably not the best uh, way to have this conducive conversation. But 
We've been talking about, you know, creating another another volume with more interviews and more people. We've been talking about how do we uh, uh, move accessibility into this. It's one of the big areas that we, mm-hmm. admittedly, I mean, again, I started thinking like 10 or 15 pages. We end up with 50. So, you know, accessibility triples that. So, and there's a lot of people doing work on accessibility. So I think there's 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 some opportunity there. Um, and I think there's, there's more opportunity to have this... Um, ongoing library or resources page that we already have on the on the Tableau Foundation's uh, Equity Hub to sort of build that out some more so that people can, you know, if they're running an organization or they're involved in an organization, they can contribute their, their ideas and their information, or if they know about books or blogs or whatever, they can contribute that and just, and just building this resource page so that anyone who is, you know, building their Tableau dashboard and wants to learn more about you know, how should they think about ordering their labels or how should they think about yeah. uh, people who identify as this particular ethnic group in this particular geography? Maybe, you know, there's there's some resources there. So there is obviously a lot to do. And um, we're we're always on the lookout for people who have expertise and thoughts on, on how we as a data viz community uh, can can do better. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. So, while, well, so while you're writing the next, uh, I'm going to call it 100 pages. That's how much I reckon he'll do in his first draft. While you're doing that, <laughs> Alice, uh, why don't you tell everybody who's watching who is now excited, because I hope you all are, uh, to go and dig into the 10 principles and a bit more of these interviews. How can people go find out more, Alice? Yeah, yeah. So as has been mentioned uh, in this, throughout this chat, uh, definitely best way is just to Google for Tableau Foundation's Racial Equity Data Hub. You'll find a lot of great material there, including a link to the Do No Harm Guides landing page. Um, and then within the guide itself, we also have a list of uh, resources at the end, linking to other uh, individuals and organizations doing a lot of great work in this space. If you want to learn more about any of the aspects we've touched on in this guide, that's a great place to find other people uh, also diving deep into those areas. And I should also note that, you know, we want this guide to be something practical and actionable. So we also have some um, supporting toolkits in there, things like checklists and summaries of the principles laid out in this guide so that we hope it will make it easier for people to really embrace and implement a lot of the these ideas that we've articulated here um, because we ultimately want this to be something that people will really bring into the way that they work with and visualize data. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Well, links will be down below on the screen, uh, so no excuse not to go check this out. Uh, John, Channing, Alice, thanks so much uh, for that deep dive into the do no harm guide i hope you've enjoyed learning a bit more about it yourselves and you know follow those links go check that out and together we can all improve the field grow the community and work with better intent and empathy with that this has been a great episode i hope you all agree Uh, i look forward to seeing you on the next episode of if data could talk take care 